your presence would be felt in this room and that we would come to you with open hearts and open minds to the message that you would speak through Pastor Pam and through us as a worship team, Lord. We love you and in your name we pray, amen. At this time, I would love for Tyler and Julie Neese to come up and bring us our Advent reading and candle lighting. The light is coming. We can see glimpses of pink and orange along the horizon, but the sun isn't up yet. There are still long stretches of shadows and places of darkness. The noises of the day are just barely audible as everything and everyone begins to rise. We live in the space between the darkness of a world without Christ and the light of a world with Christ. We'll see the light coming, yet it hasn't fully come. While we observe this season of Christ's birth and the coming of the light, we are reminded that we are still an Advent people. We live in the glow of the dawn. We are no longer people of darkness. We are people of the light, even while Christ's return is still before us. On the first Sunday of Advent, we... Advent, we light the candle of hope, a reminder of the hope we have in Christ, who came in the stable so long ago. But it's also a reminder of the hope we have that Christ will come again. We are people of the light in a world that is still so often cloaked in darkness. Lord, help us remember that we are people of the dawn, a people of hope in the places that still harbor darkness. Help us to shine your light in the places that are already illuminated with your light. Help us rejoice. Help us cling to hope through it all. Amen. Yeah. 
Amen. Well, we're going to take two minutes. We're going to greet each other. We're going to handshake. We're going to hug, high five. We're going to do non-physical welcomes if that's more your speed. So we're going to take two minutes and we're going to do that. So greet each other with love. for a minute. We did three instead of two. So if we could return to our seats and get ready for our scripture reading and prayer for this morning. Today's reading comes from Romans 13 um, verses 11b, important distinction, through 14. It says, keep in mind the times we are living in. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your sleep. The full effects of our salvation are closer now than when we first believed in Christ. The dark night of evil is nearly over, and the day of Christ's return is almost here. So let us get rid of the works of darkness that harm us. Let us do the works of light that protect us. Let us act as we should, like people living in the daytime, having nothing to do with wild parties. And don't get drunk. Don't anyone take part in sexual sins or evil conduct. Don't fight with each other or be jealous of anyone. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ as if he were your clothing. Don't think about how to satisfy sinful desires. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to be here as one body, one body gathered to respond in love and in worship to you, Father. We just pray that you would speak into the hearts and lives of all of us here today. We pray for those that are at home watching. We pray for those who wish they could be here but couldn't, Father. We love you, and we just thank you for all the love you have for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So 
as we heard from Tyler and Julie when they did our opening reading this morning, there was a lot about the dawn. So this week, um, we are, we're doing our Advent weeks a little bit differently this year, but today we're going to be talking about hope and this idea of hope is, is, is like the dawn. So as I was preparing for the sermon this Sunday, I was, I was thinking a lot about the dawn, and I'm a question asker, which serves me well, because in addition to my, my role as the senior pastor here, um, Dave and I, we also homeschool our kids. We, we always have, just because we, like, we love adventure, and we love curiosity and being outside a whole lot, and so that just kind of allowed me to keep being a pastor and do a lot of sort of adventure and experimental learning kind of stuff with our kiddos. And so I'm always asking questions and I'm always encouraging everybody in the family, like what is, what is interesting about this? So the dawn, this was my scientific question this week. What makes sunrises and sunsets so beautiful? Okay, does anybody actually know already? Like, you won't have to say it. I'm just curious. If you, if you know already, okay, if you're online, you know, you can type, give a little, a little thumbs up, a like in the, in the chat if you already know. Okay, so I did not know. There's a reason that I'm a pastor and not a scientist. So I had to read up and then, like, read it again and again and again to try to understand. But basically, here's the science scoop on this. When the sun is low on the horizon which happens during sunrises and sunsets, the light is filtering through more of the Earth's atmosphere. And when that happens, it increases scattering. Well, what is scattering? I had to figure that out. So scattering is what it's called when there's droplets or molecules that are in the atmosphere and they cause the light to change direction. So as these light waves, I had to go back, remember, light waves, there's like different colors on the spectrum, they move differently. So what happens as the light is coming through more of this atmosphere and scattering is that the blues and the violets get scattered out and it leaves behind the reds, the oranges, and the yellows. So... There you go. There's your fun fact for today. If I got it wrong, don't fire me. Or you can send your correction emails to luke at woodbridgenaz.com and complain to him. He will address that. Um, but <laughs> Advent is like the dawn. Advent is a season of the dawn. The light is coming. It's this, we, we can see glimpses of the beautiful, unique colors. But the sun isn't up yet. There, there's still long shadows. There's still pockets of darkness. Now, in the dawn, life is more still. Life is more quiet, but, but it begins to stir in the dawn, right? The neighborhood fox <laughs> makes its root through the neighborhood. Or if you have a baby or a young child, they begin to stir whether you would like them to or not. And in this season of Advent, so too do, do our souls start to stir as we look to the coming of Christ. In the season of Advent, we remember the space between the darkness of a world without Christ and the light of a world with Christ. Mary, she's heavy with child, but the baby hasn't been born yet. The world is waiting for a savior, but they don't know who it's going to be or, or when he's going to come. In our homes, some of you may do this tradition where, where the manger is out, but the baby isn't in it yet. It's a season of waiting. The light is coming, but it hasn't fully come. So, I've been a pastor for 15 years, and I've noticed some things as I've gone through a lot of Christmases as a pastor. And then in addition to that 15 years, I volunteered at a lot in churches and did every single Christmas Eve service of all of those years. So, you know, 20 plus years doing ministry at Christmas time, I've, I've observed some patterns, some, some things that happen in people's lives around this time of year. So one of the things that, that this Christmas season does 
is that it amplifies feelings of generosity, but also scarcity. From the first moment that stores, now at like Halloween, we're not even waiting for Thanksgiving anymore, but as soon as they start marketing to us to buy, 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 want, 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 give, 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 it becomes this tug of war. It becomes a tug of war to, to get us to focus on the reason for the season. It, it, it becomes this beginning of everything we don't have or we need to get rather than a celebration of all that we do have. It can bring up feelings. It stirs up feelings pretty quickly in people. Not every person every year, but as a general trend of feelings around having enough and being enough. Our financial perception of ourselves as haves or have-nots can really come under the, the microscope at this time of year in our, in our feelings and sense. Can I buy my kids everything they want? My sweetie, they deserve the world, but can I make that happen? And if I can't, what does that say about me? What do I need to do to make it happy? Should I go into debt? Should I get a second job? Or should I just buy it all, deal with it later? Or maybe I'll restrain myself. I'll put on the boundaries. I'm not going to overspend. But inside, I'm going to keep feeling like I'm not enough. A scarcity mindset is what happens when we focus so much on what we don't have that it eats up our brain power. So uh, when it's eating up our brain power, we can't flourish. And, and this is something that uh, psychologists, researchers, they, they learned this. They were studying people in poverty. What are some of the barriers to somebody uh, flourishing when they've lived in poverty? How can they move beyond that? And they discovered this thing, this scarcity mindset. And so what happens is that in this time, it started off as financial poorness, but there's many applications. Whatever area we feel poor in, whether it's money or time or calories or relationships, when there's an area where we feel poor and wanting, our brains can become consumed with the lack, consumed with what we don't have. And then when that happens, the brain can't work on flourishing. The brain can't work on clarity and acceptance or gratitude for what you do have or coming up with productive solutions to change things. And there's something about this time of year when people move into a scarcity mindset. All the things they don't have. Now, the irony is that this is a time of year where people also move into increased generosity. Uh, we have this desire to want to give more or serve more or do more. And you know what? When generosity is rooted in good and healthy things, that's great, right? Generosity is a good, godly thing. When it's coming from the whisper of the Holy Spirit, when it's coming from a desire to live like Christ, it's part of ongoing change. That's good generosity. When generosity is joyful, that's great. But the truth is that's not always what happens in generosity, right? What about when it happens out of guilt or obligation? That can come up a lot at this time of year. And then it stirs up those feelings of, I'm not enough, so I'll make up for it by spending or doing something. So I have a warm feeling today, but it's not actually coming out of the generosity that's God's best for us. Today, we want to invite hope into this Christmas reality of both scarcity and generosity, and we're going to tie it to that passage that Pastor Luke read right before we started. But I, but I want to bring up two more, two more trends that I've seen in people's lives around this time of year. The second thing I see that comes up in the Advent season is that it stirs up nostalgia and grief. 
And this time of year with Thanksgiving and Christmas, it naturally brings up memories of the past. Some may be happy memories of amazing family dinners, wonderful gifts, years that ended on a high, great time with friends. And those can be warm and fuzzy. They make us feel young again. They remind us of happy times. But when we have those good old days memories, sometimes they come up with a pretty intense comparison to how things are now, the difference between then and now. And, and we're flooded with these ideas of and memories of the relationship that fractured or when the illness came, the secret came out, or the drinking changed things. Those sweet toddlers, they're bigger and they have big problems now. Or the job that was lost, or when the bank came knocking. For some of us, the, that, that grief is from things long ago, but for some of us this season, it's very real and present when we compare this year's holiday table to last year's holiday table. There's an empty seat at the table this year, or our health, or our abilities declined, and, and the things we did last year at this time are not possible this year. And so today, we want to invite hope into this Christmas reality as well. And then the, the third thing that I've seen the Christmas season do is that it opens up hearts to new encounters in Christ. At Christmas, in our part of the world, the whole culture engages somewhat with Christmas. Of course, there's secular Christmas. There's plenty of that all around. But when else are we seeing scenes from the Bible up in people's yards? Even on like Wash FM, they're playing songs that are referencing things that have to do with Christ. There's, a, there's an openness that the, that the secular and spiritual boundary that's often up dissolves. A friend of mine, she pastors a church. In a, it's a very interesting community. It had been rural, and so now it's all new construction that's there. It's a very affluent um, area, and they are the one church in their community. There's churches, you know, around further out, but like in their city name, they are the one church. And their church is about the same size as ours, but on Christmas Eve, they have 300 to 400 people that come. They have Buddhists and Hindus who come because it is the community tradition. It is what you do on Christmas Eve in that area, not out of guilt, but just out of fun and out of, oh, this is what American Christmas is all about. It, there's just this openness that happens. And then, of course, people who are of faith, we tend to come to church more or make it a priority to come to a Christmas Eve service. Or maybe we're feeling some of these hard things that we've talked about already this morning, the feelings of scarcity or unhealthy side of generosity or our nostalgia or our grief. They open people's hearts up to finding a solution beyond themselves or beyond what culture has to open. Or just tradition, tradition of church draws people in. Christmas is a time for hope. It's a time to seek a new dawn. And the invitation for hope is for everybody, no, no matter what people believe about God or Jesus. And that's something really amazing. So today, as we look into Romans 13, this passage is specific for those people who do claim Jesus as Christ and Lord. It's, I mean, I think it's good advice for everybody, but I understand Every, not, not everybody here or online is exactly the same place. You're not necessarily a Jesus follower. You're just curious. And, and so that's okay. Take what's helpful from here. Um, but for those of you who are following Jesus, I want you to find some special hope in this passage today to remember that we are people who live in the glow of the dawn. 
that we're no longer people of darkness, but people of light. So that passage, Romans 13, it, it opens with this, the, the section we read today. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So we're going to be in Romans 13, uh, starting midway through verse 11. So in this, the night is nearly over. The day is almost here. And in this, we're, we're called and reminded that as Christians, we're Advent people. So what does Advent mean? Well, Advent comes from a Latin word, and it me, it's Adventus, which means coming. So if we are Advent people, it means we are people of the coming, people of the dawn, people of hope and expectancy who are looking for the next beautiful thing that God has in store. And as people of the coming, we live in the tension of the already and the not yet. We live in the tension that Christ is Lord, and yet Christ's kingdom is not fulfilled. The Christmas season is a reminder of hope that we have in Christ coming to a manger so long ago. And a reminder that Christ is going to come again. But for now, we live in a world of the dawn. We live in a world where there's still shadows and darkness, hurt and pain and sin. But the light has come and is coming anew. So, Romans 13, verse 11, it asks the reader next to keep in mind the times we are living in. Keep in mind the times we are living in. This phrasing communicates to the early church that they, in their time, are living in a messy situation. There's suffering and death and pain. When Jesus came, these things weren't just wiped out. Suffering and sin still existed in the world, and the early church was familiar with them, right? Where this is being written, this letter to the people of Rome, they are people living in the land of the Colosseum and all of the, the violence and abuse that, that came in that time. They're literally seeing suffering, just like we do today, and our brothers and sisters around the world do. So when we read this phrase today, keep in mind the times we are living in, it speaks to our context, too. Well, we have difficulties, too. There's the, the normal highs and lows of life, but, but we're still not fully out of the pandemic. And looking back, we can look with pretty fresh eyes to a very, very rough time for many people. We can look at the news any day, any day, and see very quickly that suffering and sin still exist in our world. And so the timeless truth here is that whether you lived 2,000 years ago when this letter to the Romans was being written or, or you live now, we can see and experience the darkness, but we also have the hope and the light of the Holy Spirit with us and Jesus Christ. Romans 13, 11 continues, The hour has already come for you to wake up from your sleep. The full effects of our salvation are closer now than when we first believed in Christ. So here, Paul is using an image of waking up. This is a, a term used throughout the New Testament, this idea of, of waking up. And, and it can tie to two things. It can tie to those who are following Christ, because often he talks about those people who are asleep. So if you're asleep in, in Paul's writings, that means 
you're not spiritually with it. <laughs> um, so the opposite of that is awake. So if you are awake in Christ, it means you get it. You're, you're living the, the Christ-like way. And it also points to the idea of resurrection, right? In, in the New Testament, we read about people being um, dead or asleep and then rising or awaking. And so Paul is pulling on this familiar imagery. He's also reminding people of their baptisms in this, to their participation in communion or in love feasts, and also reminding them there's a greater banquet yet to come when God's kingdom comes. In Christ, God invades the old age to bring about the new age. And, and so the people of Christ, they are living in a new age while waiting for Christ's return. And so this letter to them can inspire us because we too are living in the new age of understanding what Jesus Christ offers, of knowing who the Messiah is. And yet, we're waiting for all things to be made new again. Romans 13 continues at verse 12. The dark night of evil is nearly over. The day of Christ's return is almost here. So let us get rid of the works of darkness that harm us. Let us do the works of light that protect us. Let us act as we should, like people living in the daytime. Have nothing to do with wild parties and don't get drunk. Don't take part in sexual sins or evil conduct. Don't fight with each other or be jealous of everyone. So where they are in the world and at this time in history, dawn was busy, right? Before electricity, you really, your life rose and set with the power of the sun. So when that sun starts coming up, there is no sleeping in. That is part of your hours that you have to get busy, to get stuff done. And he's telling them, as you're busy, do what is right. As you're busy, though, avoid the things of the darkness. In the context of this passage, he is presenting nighttime as a time when anything goes, anything's permissible. I know now we have a bit of more of a 24-7 culture, but for real, I know parents are still telling their kids things like, nothing good happens at, after 2 a.m. Like, for real? For real, I understand wanting to stay out late, have a little extra time at the party, but after 2 a.m., nope, <laughs> nothing good happens after 2 a.m., just come home. Um, so I think it was probably even more significant in their culture. We also have these same temptations, right? If you look at this list and you feel a little awkward when you read it, because it's a little bit uncomfortable, it talks about things we don't always like talking about. These are the same issues we have today. Not one of these temptations is something that we have just bypassed in human nature. I love that, that Paul recognizes the temptations that people face. And is saying, you though, if you were a follower of Christ, no, not for you, not for you. You have to fight against the powers of the darkness. Don't let that seep in. You live as a person of light. Yeah, there's temptations out there. Yes, there's still sin out there. Yes, bad stuff is happening. Yes, everybody else is doing it. But you are no longer a person of the darkness. If you are following Jesus Christ, you are a person of the light. You are reclaimed for Christ. And you live as though his kingdom is come. You live as though God's will is being done on earth as is heaven. Because when we live for the light, even now in the midst of a messy world, we give people hope. We pass on the hope of Christ to them in a way that no amount of Christmas lights can do. No amount of gifts can do. Those things are fun. They warm our hearts. They're part of the tradition of this season. But people need the hope of Christ, not just the hope of a holiday. Paul's reminding people of their baptisms. If you have been baptized, a believer's baptism of your, of your own choice to say, I, I'm, I'm dead to my sins, I'm awake a new life in Christ, I want to remind you 
of this Bible verse from Galatians 3.27. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. You're wearing Christ. Some people like to wear team jerseys. Your team jersey says Team Jesus. When you come up out of those waters, we know that they're not what, what save you. It's Jesus that does that. But it's your, it's your public pronouncement. I'm on team Jesus. And, and so this verse reminds us, you've clothed yourself with Christ. Shine that hope of Christ with what you do. So he's tying to this. Romans 13, 14 don't be people of the darkness. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ as if he were your clothing. And don't think about how to satisfy sinful desires. Don't be focused on satisfying urges, but focus on love and grace and truth and hope, the things of Christ. The people of Christ are called to live as though the light already rules the world. We're called to live as though Christ has already come and made things right. We're called to live as a glimpse of the kingdom of heaven to come even now in this present world. Now, that may sound simple, but who's complained about something this week? Yeah, uh... Taxes, politics, uh, inflation. There's so many things we can complain about. And I'm not saying we don't ever complain, right? There's, there's appropriate ways that we need to interact when things are upsetting to us. But when our persona, publicly or with our family or in the workplace, is one of being covered in darkness and missing hope, Rather than shining bright, we're missing it. We're missing the potential that the Holy Spirit has given us to shine out into the world that is desperate for hope based on something true and real and permanent. So, as this year's Christmas season may impact you in some of the ways we started off with talking about. If, if in you it amplifies feelings of misguided generosity or scarcity, find your hope in Christ. If this year's Christmas season is stirring up nostalgia that's causing you to look to the past rather than God's best for your present and future? Turn to the Lord to be your present hope. If grief is washing over you this season, as it does for so, so many people, know that you're not alone. And Christ is your hope. And the hereafter is your hope to be reunited with, with those who also knew Christ. And in this year's Christmas season, strive to open your own heart to grow in Christ and, and be on the lookout for how the world, how your relationships need you to shine the hope of Christ on them. This Advent season, many of us are going to be wrestling with these things or already are. Many of us are going to get stuck in the scarcity mentality we're going to have to figure out how to shake ourselves out of it. Here's some things I've heard over the years or talked to people about or seen. I can't afford to give good gifts or I don't have the energy or ability to do all the things I want. And then the scarcity mentality comes in and says, I'm not enough. Or maybe it's something more like, I'm not wanted, or I'll always be lonely because I didn't get invited to as many things, or 
because friends and family have moved away or passed on or there's fracturing. There's, there's, you guys see the difference here? There's the difference between the hard thing I'm going through and how it impacts my identity. It's okay to be honest about the hard things we go to, but what happens with the scarcity mentality is you start to transfer those things to your identity. I'm not enough. I'll never be loved. I'll always be alone. I'm not valued. I'm not appreciated. And friends, those are lies from the enemy. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be lonely. But when you get to the point where you no longer see yourself as a precious child of Christ, Christ who has come so that you may have life abundant, Christ who has come to put hope in you, the hope of the Holy Spirit, so you can shine it on the world, that's the enemy. That's the enemy here to steal your hope and your joy. And my hope and prayer is that this Christmas season, that that will not happen. I don't want it for any day, but this season when when there's so much going on with our emotions and our traditions and our memories and all the things we want to do and love to do, it can all be used for good and growth and this amazing heart-opening time where it can crush your soul and just compound all of the hard things. The story of God is one of tremendous generosity. And I think that's a great reason that, that we practice generosity at Christmas time, right? But this is inspirational generosity. It, it stems from a good and holy place. It doesn't come from shame or, or obligation, but it comes from the seeds of hope and joy. Advent is the season of the dawn. Christ came, and our lives are radically transformed because of it. For those who follow Jesus, we're no longer people of darkness. We're called to no longer behave as people of the darkness, of people of the night. We are people of the day. We cast off the ways of the world to live in light. You know, the, the, the kingdom of God hasn't fully come. Things aren't fully made right yet. And to deny the reality of suffering, to deny the reality of sin, that would be a heartbreaking mistake. But in the midst of the mess and the hurt, we're called to be a glimpse of the world to come, a, a glimpse of the kingdom fulfilled. So even now, even now in the, in the rubble of decay, in the, the heartbreak of sin, we are called to be glimpses of light, called to be people of the dawn, called to be a community of hope, of grace, of goodness, of righteousness, of love. So that other people can also know the joy and the hope that we have. Let's pray. God, we come to you this morning grateful for the gift that came on that first Christmas, grateful that there, that there was a, a baby in the manger, that the prophecies came fulfilled, Lord. We know that there are those among us today who have to wrestle and fight to have hope because the things of the night, the things of the, the broken, sinful world that we live in, Lord, tug at them from illness to addiction to loss to loneliness to lies about our identity We are tempted to be overwhelmed, to lose hope. But God, guide us. Just like in the dawn, we see little bits of beauty and then it grows and it grows. Help us today to not be trapped into a scarcity mentality or, or not drown in, in the waves of, of grief. 
but instead to hold intention, acknowledging the, the truth of those feelings and circumstances while also being people of the hope, people of the dawn. God, help us to shine that hope, not only for us and our well-being, but, but because it reflects the truth of your kingdom and because we live in a world where others need hope as well. So help us, Lord, to reflect that hope. Today, God, in this season of, uh, of remembering traditions, we, we also offer today the, the words of the Lord's Prayer. And for any who, who also know this prayer, if you would like to join in in saying it and praying it together now, I encourage you to do so. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
Well, we have some things coming up that I would love to tell you about. The first is that when you came in, you received a little Christmas RSVP card. Now, this is just to help us gauge what we're looking at for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Christmas Day is on a Sunday this year, and uh, we're going to do a really different kind of service on Sunday. So Christmas Eve is going to be... um, kind of, you know, high energy. We'll have a, a, a message in there, but it's going to be a family service, so everybody will be together. We'll have Christmas carols in there. We're going to do the passing the candlelight thing. Um, that is, we, we hope members from our community will come and join us for that. Visitors are always welcome, but that is the service in my mind I'm imagining is going to be our bigger service for Christmas. But Christmas Day is a, is a Sunday, and so we're going to have a worship service, but we recognize that your plans may be different. So we just want to understand there's no, there's no guilt in this, there's no any of that. We just are trying to take a look at numbers because on Christmas Day, we're going to be doing a service called Christmas Unplugged. It's going to be very, very different. So um, do you guys remember the Drummer Boy song? Yeah, yeah Pum 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 Pum. Okay, so... That song is great if you're a drummer. Um, And like my kids like to pound on it and it's so fun. But the thing I think about in that song is kind of what I've been bringing to planning for Christmas, right? There's the tension of this little boy saying, I have no gift to bring, but yet he's going to bring his finest. And what does he have? He has his little drum. So he comes and that's in the song. That's what he does at the manger is he brings the best he has in his little boy way and he does what he can for an offering for the Lord or a, a tribute to Jesus. So Christmas morning, that's the kind of service we're going to have. It, it's going to have a very warm, family-centered feel to it. Um, We know that some of you who will be here that day, you have a gift you can bring to the Lord that day. And so um, we are going to open up signups. And so if you have a song, you know, in the realm of two to three minutes that you would like to bring as your offering for the Lord or or a testimony or a scripture reading, um, we have a multimedia-minded person who's thinking about making a a video of worship. So, um, but we want to know ahead of time. It's not open mic. It's going to be warm, but it would be chaos, and we might not want to be here for seven hours. Um, So today, one, I'd love for you to start thinking about that, but two, if you can just give your best guess about if you'll be here Christmas Eve, if you'll be here Christmas Day, um, and put that. And if the answer is no, you can just fill that out with zeros. Like, it's not going to hurt my feelings. I just want to know, because one of my ideas for a warm family Christmas morning is cinnamon rolls. And, like, I kind of need to know, am I buying 20 cinnamon rolls or 100? I mean, I can buy 100 either way, but if there's only 20 people, we are going to be throwing up if we eat all of those cinnamon rolls. So we just, we just, not Luke. I'm a machine. Machine, okay. (laughs) But that would be helpful to us. So it really just kind of starts to help us plan. So if you could just fill out that little sheet. And then in our main lobby out this side, we have a basket, and you can put that in there. Now, if this idea of my gift to bring for Jesus is already speaking to you, we do have a sign-up out there. If you would just jot down your name and your contact info, then we can get in touch with you and start to kind of work out the details. We know stuff might happen. You might get sick. Your car might break down. We know all that. We just want to start the process of planning that. Um, Also coming up, we're going to have Rev tonight, right, for our students. Uh, So teens, come back tonight, 6 p.m., meet downstairs. And then the 18th, though, is going to be the Revolution Youth Party. It's going to be at the Robbins home. So if you haven't been there yet, don't know their address, please uh, connect with Pastor Luke or the church office so we can send you to the right spot. December 23rd is a Friday, And many people have off from work or school, and so we are going to open our doors to do a winter break edition of Project Friday. If you were here around Easter, we did Project Fridays, and so it's a time where people of all ages and abilities can come together, and we'll have some things to do around the church. So that's another way that people can come and bring their offering by helping us. Specifically, we'll be working downstairs to transform our community connection closet and clothing closet, a project we worked on during Hanging of the Greens. And so we would love to have folks uh, show up for that and help us. 
and participate. Well, today we have talked about hope. We have talked about um, also kind of the Christmas season and generosity and healthy generosity versus not. So I do want to say this church exists because of your generosity. Thank you so much. Um, we do encourage people, if this is your church home, to participate in giving an offering or a tithe and, and to participate in the blessing of that, not out of obligation or guilt, but as part of God's delightful invitation to participate in the kingdom of God. And, and so um, if you feel called to that today or that's a habit of generosity you already have, um, we do have our offering box in the lobby there. We also have ways to give online or you can mail it in. And let's pray now over that offering. God, we come to you today uh, thinking about that little drummer boy and that idea of coming before you with what we have. God, we pray uh, ahead of time for our Christmas Eve service, our Christmas Day service, that you are at work in that and the, the special way that people's hearts open around Christmas. But God, we also come to you um, with hearts of generosity, God, we pray um, over health in that area for, for us as we develop in all of the fruits of the Spirit, God, whether it's hope or joy or peace or love or self-control, God, all, all of them continue to grow those in us today, Lord. And as, as we bring our offering to you, as we dedicate it to your service, God, um, we just ask that you continue to guide our, our leadership team as we uh, care for the people of this church, care for this amazing building, and care for our community in your name, Lord. Amen. Well, with that, I would love to invite Ken up, who is going to be giving us our benediction. Announcement. Sorry to interrupt. We uh, do have our Christmas tag, tag tree out here. Oh, you're right. And we are still missing three tags. Tags 8B, 21B, and 24A. If you grab those tags, you know who you are. The deadline to have those gifts in is by Wednesday because, I guess really before Wednesday, because we're delivering the gifts uh, to the school on Wednesday. So uh, if you have those tags or you know who does, I'm not going to bully them, but we're going we're to pressure them a little bit to get them in here so that we can get those delivered to who they need to be delivered to. Or if things have changed and you can't do it, just let us know, and yeah, we'll send somebody out to buy the stuff. That no too. problem. <laughs> that, was a lot, that was a lot nicer than I what know. I okay. Anything else, Luke? Did I cover it all? Whew. Okay. I'm glad you normally do the announcements. Okay. Ken, if you would come and bring us our benediction today. Oh, look at you folks. I didn't even have to say stand for the benediction. All right. <laughs> All right, today's benediction comes from Romans 13, big shocker. Uh, Pastor Pam said it, Christmas is the time to seek a new dawn. So, may we discard the deeds of darkness, put on the armor of light, and walk with decency. As we celebrate the Christmas season, let us not put on airs, let us instead put on the Lord Jesus Christ, making provision, making no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. O oh Lord, create in us a pure heart and renew a steadfast and loyal spirit within us. Go in peace. <laughs>